Uh, here's uh, what we believe about the Bible, in case you're new to us. Uh, I like to say this once in a while. We do believe the Bible is the actual inspired Word of God, the direct revelation of God to man, everything we need for salvation and to live your Christian life. And so because of that, we treasure the Word of God here at Calvary Hills Baptist Church. We study it in its context, and we preserve the intended meaning of the original author to the best of our ability. And that's why we study it line by line. And so uh, that means that you know what I'm going to talk about today, which means that you can turn in your Bibles to the end of Acts chapter 4, and we are going to spill into Acts chapter 5 today. I want us to start by comparing two different moments of when an offering was given. So it's a normal day of worship at the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem. The time comes for the offering to be taken. These were the days before electronic giving, before checks even. And so it was much easier at this time to know who gave what and probably how much. In this particular church, uh, you may have actually seen this still happens in some churches. There's a, a basket in the front where people walk their offering to the front and uh, give it in sort of a moment where we all have this uh, play some music, everybody walk to the front, drop it in there. So this church happened to be like that, except there was even a little steel uh, bottom on this uh, basket. So anything dropped in there made a, a clear sound. You knew exactly what it was. And so an older widow walked up to the offering box, dropped in two coins. It was a pathetic sound. It was the sound like dropping two dimes into an industrial-sized oil drum. Uh, clink, clink. Everybody heard it. Some of the religious people in the, con in the congregation, they chuckled a bit to themselves. They began to do the math in their head about, hmm, let's see, that sound probably equaled about 20 cents. Okay, and so uh, the widow returned to her seat. Next, a wealthy man and his wife stood up, and they sauntered to the, to the front. Everyone knew they owned a lot of property on the west side of Jerusalem. Everybody knew they had money. They gave a lot to the church throughout the years, and everybody knew that they gave a lot to the church throughout the years. There was even a memorial plaque on the pulpit to let everyone know who bought it. Can you believe? The man remarked to his wife as they approached the front of the sanctuary, just loud enough for others to hear, I'm just glad we can help the church. All the money from selling that field will really do a lot of good here. And they whispered un unnaturally loud, just so everyone could hear it. As he struggled to lift the bag of coins and slowly poured it into the metallic container, the sound of falling coins filled the room. Clink, 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 pitter-patter, pitter-patter. You know, it sounded like if you turned one of those rain sticks over. Shh. This is the sound of heavy falling coins. This was a different sound than the widows. Awe filled the room. There was a generous offering that had just been made to give the entire proceeds of their sale of this property to the church. The pastor was seen doing the moonwalk visibly in the background because of the amount of money that was given. Must have been hundreds, maybe thousands of, of dollars. Now, which of these two offerings was more pleasing to God? This actually isn't really a parable that I made up. Now, the moonwalking's not in there. But this is basically two different stories in the Bible that I have pieced together for dramatic effect. This happened. The story of the widow and her small gift occurred in the ministry of Jesus, and you can find that in Luke 21, 1-4. through Jesus stood up and praised the widow for her small gift and said that she had actually given more than anybody on that day. The other story is our passage today. Ananias and Sapphira. Except when they gave their offering, they died immediately afterward. And the text implies God put them to death. They were an example to the young church that was growing, that was booming. But how can that be? How can God prefer a smaller offering than a larger offering? How can there be stipulations on what we bring before God? The lesson that I want to show from the scriptures today can really be boiled down to this idea. When it comes to our worship of God, we cannot adopt the mindset that anything goes. God cares, listen to this, about the heart behind the offering more than he cares about the offering itself. Okay? It's a powerful moment in the life of any Christian when you realize that God does not need my money to exist. God does not need my singing to exist. God does not need my serving in this church to accomplish his work in the world. 
God already has everything. He's not really impressed by man-made offerings. But what I do want to show you today, that God, most of all, wants our hearts. God desires a heart devoted to Him. Giving, yes. Singing, yes. Serving, yes. Out of a place of purity of heart rather than out of hypocrisy. Church, we will have an opportunity today to examine our hearts and ask the Spirit of God to cleanse and take away any hypocrisy or impurity from us. To pass the refiner's fire over our motives. From this text, we're going to be challenged to give and serve because we love God, not for the praise of man. So as we go to the Word, would you pray with me? That may reflect back on us in our hearts. And so Lord, as with any text, we ask for your divine help to interpret and apply this in ways that I cannot do to our hearts. Lord, may your spirit move in this place now as your word is read. In Jesus' name, amen. So the story really begins with Acts 4.32. Uh, this is a good time. I've been waiting for a moment to say this. Uh, so I'm going to say this is just fun fact, pure fun fact, okay? This is scholar Jerry talking, okay? Uh, nine out of ten Christians don't know this, so this is good. The chapter and verse divisions in the Bible were not originally there. So uh, some people have never heard that. They think that when Paul wrote these letters, you know, or John wrote his gospel, that it was like John chapter 3, verse 16. No, that never happened. People added that after the fact. And actually, in case you want to know, it was in the year 1227. Stephen Langton, the Archbishop of Canterbury, <laughs> wrote those and put those divisions in. And we still use them today. And the Wycliffe English Bible of the 1300s uh, was the first Bible to include chapter and verse divisions. Fun fact for you. So because those are man-made, sometimes they fall in weird places. Sometimes they don't divide the passage perfectly. So this is one of those days where, you know, if old Jared was doing it, maybe I would have made this all one story. But it's not up to me. Here we go. Acts 4.32 through 37. This is the pre-story. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus, Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So there are two noteworthy Setups in this passage that are going to come up later. And Luke does this in the book of Acts. He will often uh, put something out there, tease it, and it's going to come back around later. You'll see that when Paul shows up at the stoning of Stephen, and then we, we learn his story later. So this is a Luke thing to do. Uh, we're going to see that the church begins this radical generosity, which we've referenced before. People were divesting themselves of their assets and instantly and immediately bringing a remedy to poverty in this church. So Church probably by this point about twenty to thirty thousand people, so it's kind of like a uh, American mega church, except everybody's on board and doing all the right things here, uh, radically on fire for the Lord. And at this moment in church history, there really are no deacons. We're going to get to that in chapter six. Uh, it was apostle heavy up front, so that's why you see people bringing these and lay them at the feet of the apostles. Um, and it makes sense because they're doing all these miracles. They're doing all the preaching. They were the representation of Christ in the minds of people. And so uh, you see people bringing their, uh, their goods and uh, the money from their sale of all these things and laying them down at the feet of the apostles. And they were doing the distributing. They're pretty trustworthy guys, we would imagine. So uh, the, the, the second setup you see is, like I said with Paul, we're introduced to a character named Barnabas. So just register that. He's not going to come up today. But what he is is sort of the anti-Ananias. He's pictured as this precursor of, look at what Barnabas did. He did it the right way. Now let's hear a story that does it the wrong way. And so this is where we're going to get into our actual text of the day. Read again with me, Acts 5, 1. But, there's that, uh-oh, but a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, 
he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of this land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. And when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard it. The young man rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. And Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And when the young man came in, they found her dead. And they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. You better believe great fear. Great fear is on me right now reading that passage. That's kind of chilly. So, let's be honest. You can understand how this story might strike people as strange or out of place. It's really the first sin of the church listed in the book of Acts. I mean, things have been pretty smooth up to this point, going swimmingly. People are getting saved. People are uh, giving away all of their goods to the poor. Things are awesome. Now, there's been persecution, but it's been from the outside. This is the first struggle that they've received from the inside. A warning call has been sounded. And now, uh, I will say this. If you understand this story to be strange, especially, uh, you're going to think that if you've just read the New Testament. So, uh, I've read the Old Testament. This is actually very much in line with God. And so, that leads me to a point that I need to say, because it kind of flies in the face of what is being said by a lot of preachers today. Here it is. The Jesus of the New Testament is the same God as the God of the Old Testament. Okay? We just need to put that out there and know where we stand. Things like sin and purity and holiness didn't take a back seat when sweet, cuddly Jesus showed up. That's what people want you to believe. Okay, Remember who's coming on the clouds with a, you know, a rope dipped in blood and, and a sword in his mouth. Just remember who you're talking to. Okay, So this story reminds us about God and it reminds us about man. It tells us what God wants from us and what he doesn't want from us. And so, uh, that's my two points. What does God want? What, what does God not want? That's my two points. I'm keeping it simple. Gave y'all seven last week. So, giving you two today. One day I might need one. And Eric's glasses might fall off. All right. So, number one. What does God want from us as we worship him? Number one, God desires our hearts. Really simple today, guys. Number one, God desires our hearts. So, as we look at Ananias and Sapphira, the husband and wife team, they were a part of the church, so yes, they probably were Christians. No reason to think that they were not. Uh, they were doing what many others in the church were doing. They were uh, liquidating their assets rather than accumulating wealth, an admirable thing. So other believers were being lifted out of poverty. Uh, as we discover from the text, they had devised a plan to present the offering as if they were donating the entire profit from the sale of the property, but they were only going to give a smaller percentage of the sale. So, in case you're not following, in case this is like, I don't really understand, let's say I take that guitar right there. That's my Taylor guitar. He's my friend. Uh, mm -hmm. I take and I get, let's just say I put it on eBay and I get $1,200 for it. Some of y'all, the oh, guitar? Yeah, that's what they cost. Let's say I get $1,200 for that guitar on eBay. Um, and then I take $800 and I donate it to Calvary Hills Baptist Church, keeping $400 in my pocket. Now, Aside from reading this story, wouldn't you say, man, that's just a generous thing to do, yeah. right? You would. Did I have to sell my guitar to begin with? Does anything in the Bible require that I do that? Okay, not unless God told me to. Not unless I sensed God was leading me to do that. Now, if God was leading me to do that, then yes, I had to do that. Uh, did I have to, once I sold it, give anything to the church once I sold my guitar? You better hope not. You guys buy and sell stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, some people sell cars and they sell houses. And you don't necessarily think, I have to do this or that, right? So, the problem is not the buying, the selling. The problem is that I would have presented the information inaccurately. I would have presented it as if I gave the entire sale of the guitar to the church, but in actuality, I kept back 
a price for myself. That's exactly what happened here in the story today. Ananias and Sapphira conspired to act like they gave 100% of the sale of their property to the church, but they did not. So, verse 4 is really great because it reveals Peter's question to Ananias. Why did you do this? I mean, you can read it right there. Basically, he's saying, why did you do this? Nobody pressured you to sell the land. When you owned it, you had 100% of it. And when you sold it, nobody asked you to give 100% to the church. It's your money. Use it when you need it. J.G. Wentworth, you need cash now, right? So if it was your money, you didn't have to donate it. Why did you say that? And so I think Ananias revealed something that we all struggle with. We fundamentally miss out on what God wants from us. We think that God wants our stuff more than he wants us. Or we think that God will love us more if we give him more. Or we think what other Christians think about us will increase the love that God has for us. So think about what Ananias and Sapphira tried to do. They wanted to project an image of themselves that they were generous to. They wanted others to look and say, wow, look at those Christians. They're always giving, always serving, always there anytime the doors are open. They're always doing the right thing. But at the core of this false positive was a lie. They were hypocrites. They brought a false offering based on a lie to gain the affirmation in the eyes of the church, not in the affirmation of the eyes of God. They brought impure hearts to the altar of God's worship. So I want to tell you about this. There's a phrase in Catholic theology called uh, ex opere operato, that bless your soul today, right? We're in Latin. Uh, it's a Catholic phrase uh, that they use in their worship. It means from the work worked, ex opere operato. Uh, that means that when the sacraments are taken in the Catholic Church, for example, when the priest gives the parishioners the communion, just for example, it is an effective means of grace whether there is faith on the part of the priest or the parishioner. Okay? Or faith at all. So, layman's terms. You receive grace from the sacrament whether you believe any of this works or is real or not. It has nothing to do with the heart that you bring. It's whether or not your body did the ritual. Whether you went through the process, okay? Ex opere operato, from the work worked. It works either way as long as you physically do the ritual. Now, I think a lot of us, probably, in the Protestant church, do a lot of the things that we do in that principle, even though it's absolutely untrue and not a Protestant principle. Our bodies go through the motions of worship, but our hearts are disconnected from what we're physically doing. What we see here in the case of Ananias and Sapphira is that it absolutely mattered what the condition of their heart was when they came to worship God. See, this is not a mechanical thing. I feel like I use that word right now, mechanical. Do I say this all the time? This is not a mechanical thing. Sunday morning, eyes pop open. Don't wake daddy. Boom, just pop up. Sitting up in the bed. All of a sudden, I feel myself going to brush my teeth. I feel myself getting in the car, going to church, putting my clothes on. All of a sudden, I'm here. Hey, I'm singing. And then you look up, and you just your body has gone through this process. But was your heart engaged in the things that you were doing? See, there, there's no chart in heaven that has gold stars and smiley faces that gives us points for the good deeds that we do. Uh, there's no, Jared gave his offering this week, plus 10 righteousness points. There's no Gene saying out loud this week, plus five righteousness points. There's no thanks for coming to the serve day yesterday, plus 50 righteousness points. No scale in heaven like that. And that's because the, fun to, the fundamental truth close to the heart of God says this. God desires our hearts more than what we do for him. Let me tell you an Old Testament story. I want to prove this and then I'm going to slam it shut and I'll be done. I'm going to... I love this story. It always grounds me. It always makes me remember my place relative to God. It comes from 1 Samuel in the Old Testament, chapter 15, in case you want to read it later. I'm going to have to paraphrase it because it's a long story. <coughs> king Saul had just been appointed the first official king of Israel. Samuel, the prophet, was basically holding down Israel for the time being. And so they wanted a king. They got a king. King Saul is now their guy. In those days, everybody wanted to take your land all the time. It was just the way the world worked. And so they had to go out and fight a battle against a nation called the Amalekites. Bad blood. 
bad blood with the Amalekites. So Israel's going up to fight against them. Samuel the prophet takes Saul aside before the battle and says, I just spoke with God. He told me something to tell you regarding the battle. You need to finish the job. When you go in there, don't leave anything alive. Don't take any goods back. Don't take the spoils of war back home. I don't want to see anything. Come back. No gold trinkets. Nothing. Leave everything there. No prisoners. Are we understood? Saul says, yes. Understood. So, they go out. They fight the battle. Israel wins. The next day, the prophet Samuel comes out to check on King Saul. How did things go in the battle? All of a sudden, Samuel, at the campsite... With the soldiers, here's. <laughs> what is that? What is that sound that I hear? I won't do all the other animals. That was the only one I had. <laughs> then he hears the oxen. He hears, uh, he sees stacks of trinkets and things brought back from the battlefield. And worst of all, he looks in the corner. There's the king, Agag, tied up, hogtied, sitting there alive. Samuel throws up his hands and says, Please tell me, I'm not seeing what I'm seeing. What's up with the sheep? Why am I hearing what I'm hearing? I thought we talked about this. You heard me say what God said to do, right? You heard it? King Saul says something that we do all the time, all right? He says, oh, we decided to keep some things, but don't worry. We were going to take those things and make a sacrifice to God anyway. That's what we were going to do. So, sure, we might have not have done it exactly the way God said it, but our intentions were good because we were going to take that and make a sacrifice of those sheep anyway. Here's what Samuel said. Listen, these are good words. These are prophetic words. Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. One more time. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Yeah. And to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is just like divination. Presumption, just like idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, the Lord has rejected you from being king. And the pain dropped. And from that moment forward, David was God's king. Think about... That sentence, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices in obeying the voice of the Lord? What does that mean? It means that God doesn't care what you do or don't do for him if he doesn't have your heart. Jesus said, if you love me, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, right? Right? If you love God, if he has your heart, listen to him, obey him. Saul thought he could get points by disobeying God and making an offering to God. You see the irony there? I'll get points with God by making a sacrifice to God. Ananias and Sapphira did the exact same thing. We'll get points by disobeying God and making an offering, a sacrifice to God. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What is the opposite of being pure in heart? That's what I want to look at really in our next point because that's where we are. We know what God wants. So what's the opposite? What does God not want? Well, we see what God wants. He desires our hearts. Next, number two, God destroys our hypocrisy. God destroys our hypocrisy. Peter twice reveals to both Ananias and Sapphira exactly what was at the heart of their sin. We don't have to guess. He says it. If you'll compare verses 3 and verse 9, you'll see the same uh, one response to Ananias, one response to Sapphira. He says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? And then he says to Sapphira, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Now, as a Bible guy, I find it interesting that Peter appealed to the Holy Spirit in this particular case. Uh, the Greek for that verb, to lie, you may know the English root of it. So if we look behind that word, why did you lie to the Holy Spirit, it's the Greek, pseudomai. Anybody know what English word sounds like that? Pseudonym, right? It's a pseudonym. That's where we get that word. To present a false front, to falsify the Spirit, literally, is what it says. And so literally, it's like Peter is saying, you are making a false presentation 
of the Spirit's working. What did Jesus think about this? Again, we don't have to guess, we know. In his earthly ministry, he took serious issue with the Pharisees saying that his miracles were done by the power of Satan. In fact, the most serious maybe Jesus ever got was something that he said. He called it the unpardonable sin, did he not? Blaspheming of the Holy Spirit, saying that these miracles done clearly by the power of the Spirit are done in the power of Satan. So what we have in our story today just reverses that. The Pharisees said that Jesus' true work of the Spirit was a work of Satan, while Ananias did a work of Satan, but tried to pass it off as a work of the Spirit. So that's exactly what happened here in this text. This is a serious issue to God. And in verse 9, Peter uses another word, pyrazo, when he says that the Sapphira tested the Spirit of the Lord. That's the same word that Satan uh, used against Jesus. He brought him out in the wilderness to tempt him, to test him. That's that same word. So not a kind word from Luke. Now, we know enough Bible language, you and I both do, to sit here and wag our heads and say things like, how terrible, how terrible Ananias and Sapphira, those cads, those rapscallions. <laughs> I can't believe they would do such a thing like that. We would never, and never, not in this church, not this guy, we would never do something like that. Guys, we do this all the time. We do it all the time. How many times have we tested God in our lives? Have you ever repeated the same sin over and over and over after you came to understand that it was a sin? Is that not testing God? What you gonna do, God? What you gonna do? I'll do it again. You gonna stop me? Until you step out of heaven, wipe me clean. Unless you kill me, I'm gonna keep doing it. That's called testing God. That's exactly what that is. Have you ever done something to misrepresent yourself to look better in the eyes of other people? Have you ever gone to lengths to hide how sinful you really are so that you can keep your status amongst your church friends and amongst your church? Do you know that we are no better than Ananias and Sapphira? God, here's a humbling thought. I don't say this lightly. But it's serious. At any of those times in your life when you or I did that, do you understand God rightfully could have killed us at that moment? Rightfully. That's a crazy thing to think about. If every time we offered worship with an impure heart here at this church, somebody dropped dead, I'd have to keep an ambulance on standby outside. Now our flesh wants to present a perfect image to those around us, while hiding the darkness within our hearts. That's what your flesh wants to do. Darkness hates exposure. Darkness hates light. But Peter said, this is actually lying to the Holy Spirit of God. It's from Satan, is what he said. So what are we supposed to do? What's the opposite of hypocrisy? I'll give you three. Honesty, sincerity, and authenticity. That's the opposite. That's what God wants from us, isn't it? A clean heart, a pure heart, an authentic, honest, sincere heart. Let me tell you about a parable. I'm quoting a lot of scripture today. I like it. Let me tell you about a parable that I love from Luke 18. I don't know why God just had all these Jesus parables in my mind when I was going through this. So here's a parable that I love. Luke 18. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat on his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. As God sits on his throne and two prayers rise up to the nostrils of God, both prayers 
uttered from the same lips of sinners. Both are sinners. One recognized that he was. One covered up who he was. Which prayer did God honor? You know the answer. Not every offering that is presented before God is accepted. We need to say that. Not everything done is acceptable to God. That goes for your life. That goes for me. That goes for things that churches do. Just because it's a church and you do something doesn't mean God's happy with it. There's a lot of things you can do to upset God. Not every sacrifice is accepted. Ask Cain and Abel. Ask Nadab and Abihu. Just because something is offered doesn't mean that God wants it. And when it comes to our hypocrisy, our inauthentic worship, God doesn't even want it. More than that, he exposes hypocrites. He judges hypocrisy. Man, I'm thinking of the book of Amos. I hope I'm right because I didn't write this down. The book of Amos, primarily one of the themes of that book is God telling his people, Listen, y'all should just shut it down. You've been going through empty worship for decades. These sacrifices don't mean anything. You might as well just say we're a butcher shop. You're just killing animals. There's there's nothing in your heart behind what you're doing. So guess what, guys? Here's what God says. Guess what? Just shut it all down. I don't need this. I don't need this. Remember what he said? I can get my praise out of a rock if I really needed to be praised. If I had some compulsive need to be praised, I'll just, I'll, I'll grow a mouth on that table down there, and it'll sing my praises. I've got angels surrounding me all day, guys. I don't need this. That's a, we don't think about God like that. We make him so needy. Make, like he's just up there sad with a little tin cup. Please, praise for God, please. Like we can just do anything, and he'll, and he'll be thankful for it. That's not why he made such an intricate system for his people to approach him in holiness. He's not desperate. But because he wants us, in spite of how sinful we are, that shows you how much he actually loves you and desires your praise. Isn't that amazing? I feel like I've said this before. The God that needs nothing the God that has no deficiency in himself still desires the praise of a broken sinner. How? Probably two things I can think of. Number one, Jesus gets glory in the end on our lips. Number two, your life is benefited greatly from worshiping and connecting with God. Because in order for you to worship him rightly, he has to clean you up and actually deal with your sin. So we benefit actually a lot from being able to praise God. We don't like to think of God as a judging God. We don't like to think of him that way because we, we bring our, our worship and sometimes inauthentically and we want to think we can just do whatever we want but God judges and he says no. We don't want to think about him like that. Let me tell you why. I'll skip the suspense. The judge in any situation is the one with power. Any judge has power and, and final authority. And so the judge can say what's right and wrong and if God is the judge that means that we're not the judge. That's what that means. And that's why the cultural cry of 21st century America is don't judge me because I can do whatever I want. Listen, that may make us feel really good in the short term. You may get a weight off of your shoulders briefly by shouting don't judge me at the world, but let me tell you that is not a reality. You will stand before the judge of the universe because God is the judge. He can see our hearts and he knows what we do in hypocrisy and he knows what we do with the genuine heart. God knows. God knows. Omniscient. He knows. And in the story of Ananias and Sapphira, God sounds a warning call to the church at that time and even to us today. Look at verse 11. He says, And great fear came upon the whole church. I believe there was fear. And upon everybody who heard it, there was fear. That's, that word is phobos, phobia, that, real fear, real fear. 
Do you know what stifles the church from catching fire? A lack of trust that people are being genuine with one another. A suspicion of hypocrisy running rampant will kill. It will throw a wet blanket on any fire that we think we're catching. If we're, if we're wondering who's legit in here, who's genuine, who's here for the right reasons. If we start putting on our detective hats and start thinking that way about one another, it's done. Wet blanket on the fire. Either God's going to kill somebody or the Spirit of God will just stop working. Those are really the two options. The young church in the New Testament was Spirit-powered up till this moment. And as Warren Wiersbe says, if the Spirit cannot defeat, I'm sorry, if Satan cannot defeat the church by attacks from the outside, he will get on the inside and go to work. And that's what he did. That's what he did. God brought immediate judgment in this case rather than delayed judgment for sin. Sometimes God does that, you know. You can, I can think. Actually, I'll just tease it. Come tonight at 6.30 and, uh, and I'll tell you all the times when God did immediate judgment. All right, there it is. Mm -hmm. got to give you a reason to come back, right? Mm -hmm. And so church, I want us to take a moment as we think about this. As we think about this story. It's a heavy story, right? I mean, you know, you can kind of feel it. It's a heavy story. I want us to take a moment and examine our hearts in light of this passage. It doesn't do anybody any good to say, wow, good story. <sighs> All right, what's for lunch? You know, we, we can't just do that. We've got to take a moment and look and say, Spirit of God, pass over me and look in here. And is that in there? Is what we read about not just in here, but is it in here? We've got to do that. We've got to take that moment. Take a moment, examine our hearts. When we worship God, are you bringing your heart with you to church? Are you bringing, that's step one, are you bringing your heart with you to church? Do you come open and say, God, speak to me today. Tell me something, Lord. I want to hear your voice. Are you bringing your heart to church? Are you engaging your heart meaningfully with God? Or is all of this for some other reason? People in India that I talk to find it strange that Americans would go to church for any other reason because they're being persecuted. And so for us, you wouldn't believe. There's lots of reasons people go to church that have nothing to do with the gospel. People do strange things now. Do you know people will fake a religion to please their parents? People will give actual tithe money to clear a guilty conscience. They will. People will sit through a sermon. They don't even like me. They'll sit through this sermon just so that they can network with other people afterwards. People will bring kids to church because they want the activities for their kids, even though they aren't worshiping Christ at church. Parents are just using babysitting services. So why are you here? Why are you here? Are you seeking to offer your heart to the true and living God? Are there areas in your life where you're presenting a picture of yourself that is actually laced with hypocrisy? The lesson of the day is this. God cares more about the heart behind your offering. That is your attendance, your praise, your money, your serving. He cares about the heart behind those things than those actual things themselves. God wants your heart in worship. He wants you to love him and connect with him and have joy in knowing him. And so church, we're only going to catch fire when we root out the hypocrisy in our own life. I've said this before, I'll say it again. There's two things that start every single revival in history. Prayer Getting serious about dealing with sin. Those are the two things every single worldwide revival was built upon. It started with a prayer meeting. And at that meeting, people got serious about dealing with the sin in their lives. And so we're not going to be any different here. We can do a lot of cool stuff. I can do a lot of cool stuff. Even though I'm not really that cool myself, I can do cool things, you see. We can, we can have a lot of fun. We can do a lot of cool things. But at the, at the end of this... 
down deep, unless people are actually on their face in prayer, and people are actually looking at their lives and say, what sin do I need to root out like a weed from my life? We're not going to go further and farther until we do those things. Every single one of those things, it's like a, it's like a, a TV tied to your ankle. And you're trying to go boldly and proclaim Christ in the world. And you still got sin and nastiness and junk hanging on your ankles. So that's my challenge to us today, church. To root out the hypocrisy in our life. To give our hearts wholly over to God. That's what a spirit-filled church looks like. So let's ask God to make us into a church that, like our vision says, trusts the Spirit of God and offers our heart to Him. Amen. Would you pray with me?